chapter 5 of Revelation says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. I'm kind of fascinated with the idea of all the saints that have already gone to heaven and all of creation and all of us singing at the same time the praises of God. All of creation praises him, and this is our practice for eternity. Would you join us in standing as we sing our praises to God?
are the lamb who was slain and you are worthy of all of our praise we join together today with all the saints in heaven and all of creation to praise your holy and mighty name thank you for being the spotless lamb of God who gave your life so that we would have life thank you for our time together in worship this morning pour out your spirit and touch our hearts we love you and thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While our children are coming down to the front for our children's sermon, I'll invite you to greet one another and then join us in singing, Shall We Gather at the River? seated. Thank you. Well, I just repeated Leslie, didn't I? I'm delighted to welcome you to worship here at First Baptist Church on this marvelous day of the fall. And isn't this choir look great? They have threatened to sit out here and make us sit up there if, if they keep growing. I think you can show them some love. Yeah. I think, I think that's a great thing. If you are our guest today, we're delighted you're here, and the only thing we ask that you would tear off the fly leaf and put it in the offering plate as it's passed so we get a chance to get better acquainted with you. We're glad to welcome Terry and Christine home after their great Western tour. And uh, good to see you back in, back in worship, and there will be room for you next week in the choir. All right. yeah, I'm gonna, I, we're making room this week. Today's worship service is tied around the theme of remembering some folks who have preceded us. They are already in heaven. And if the book of Hebrews is right, they are cheering us on in our Christian walk. And so today we remember and celebrate, and it causes us to think 
about what is heaven like. And so the message today is a redefinition, a, another definition of heaven. I'll have to make, you'll have to wait and me see what I mean by that. I'm delighted you're here. Miss Susan has our children's sermon today. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so glad that you're here today. It's been great being with you in Bible study this morning. And so I want you to do something for me just now. I want you to think in your mind, just quietly, okay, not out loud, but think in your mind the best place you've ever been. Maybe it's because it's the most beautiful. Maybe it's because it's the most fun. Maybe it's just a special place that your family always goes. Think in your mind the best place you can think of. Okay. You got something special in mind? All right, I'm going to just ask two of you, and then you're going to have to tell me the rest after worship. You can come and tell me, okay? All right. Two people that want to tell me the best place you've ever been. Maggie? Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville, Florida, okay? And I saw Aurora's hand next. Disney World, and I thought that would be somebody's favorite place, probably. So, well, you know what? As great as those places are, I know of a place that I've read about that's going to be even better than that. Can you even imagine, based on what we've already talked about this morning, where that place might be? Heaven. Heaven. Now, You've heard about heaven before, right? And if you've read Revelations at all, you've probably picked up some things that heaven might be like. But in heaven, there's not going to be any more crying, no more pain, no more sadness, right? No more bad things happening or going on, the Bible says. And if the Bible says it, do we believe it? Yes, Yes, very much so. It also talks about, as Miss Leslie mentioned, thousands and thousands of angels singing. Can you imagine that? It also says in Revelation 21 that there won't be a sun, there won't be a moon. We don't need those things. You know why in heaven we don't need those things? Because God's beauty and his magnificence is going to light the entire heavens for us. We won't need light bulbs, any of that kind of stuff. I see that amazement on that face. Isn't that the best look right there? I mean, that's what it's all about. We don't need anything in heaven to light it because God's beauty, the Bible says, is going to do that for us. The Bible talks a lot about heaven and about the beauty of it, the streets of gold, the walls that are built out of the most expensive jewels that you can even think of, sapphire, rhinestones, all those things that I don't have is what I'll get to see in heaven and what it's going to be made of. But the most special thing about heaven is that finally we will see face-to-face Jesus and God. Isn't that incredible? To think about that after all this time of not knowing what they look like and not being able to see and to touch, we're going to finally be able to do that. It's going to be the most special place we could ever go. But there's only one way to get there, and that's through Jesus and becoming a Christian. And you all have heard us talk about the ABCs, right? Admit, believe, confess. I know, over and over, right? We talk about the ABCs. But that's how we're all going to get to heaven, the only way. So if you want to get to the most beautiful place in the world, someday when you're ready, you're going to admit, believe, and confess. Today we're talking about the people that are already in heaven. And each week in our Bible study time, you all sometimes will bring up people that are already in heaven, and you want to hope that they're doing okay. They're doing great in heaven, right? So today, as we think about people that have died and gone on to heaven before us, just remember them in your head and in your mind. Say a special prayer and hope that someday we're going to get there to see them as well. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for this great day and for the beauty of your weather, the beauty of this earth that you've given us and all the good things that we get to see and experience. But Father, help us to know that there is no better place to be than heaven. 
So we look forward, actually, to the day that we get to be there and to see you in all of your brilliance and in all of your glory. And, Father, I just pray that these boys and girls, when it's right for them, that they will admit, believe, and confess so that they can experience what it's like to be in heaven with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Hopefully everybody's doing well today. I have some ministry highlights that I would like to share. So if you have your bulletin, I am going to Vanna White a couple of items. So if you'd like to flip through and follow along with me, you can. Um, The first thing that actually isn't in there is um, the senior adult ministry. They're going to Derby Dinner Playhouse on December 4th, and they're going to see Holiday Inn next Sunday, which is the... 11th, thank you, is the last day to sign up and pay. So if you would like to go with the um, Senior Adult Ministry to see Holiday Inn on December 4th, please make sure that you sign up and pay before next Sunday, the 11th. Um, Next Sunday at 2 p.m., there are two particular people here that are very excited to share that there is going to be a baby shower for Elizabeth Cobbin. She's welcoming a baby girl, and all the females in the church are invited. Sorry, gentlemen. Um, Maybe you could help in the kitchen with cleaning. Um, There's also information in your bulletin board about the shoebox for Appalachia, um, which is our ministry through Scarlet Jasper. Our church goal is, how many boxes? Do we have a goal set? I don't know if we have a goal. Okay, so our goal is a million, and let's just get as many as we possibly can close to a million. Um, The boxes are due in two two weeks on November 18th. So if you um, open your bulletin board, there is this fly leaf in there that talks about what items they're looking for, how much to spend, all that information. Um, If you have any other questions, you can contact June in the office. Also in your bulletin, there is a sign-up sheet for Secret Saints. Um, If you'd like to participate, please fill out this leaflet. It's the one with the really neat sunglasses. No, incognito, secret saints. Um, And if you would like to participate, I have been told that it is a lot of fun. So um, maybe this year I will participate as well. So hopefully that's an encouragement to get more participants. Um, Please be sure to check up on your bulletin for other upcoming events. And notice that there are some prayer requests in the flyleaf. And then also Wednesday night dinner reservation forms are in there. This Wednesday is um, chicken, fried chicken. And everybody's bringing a potluck side, and the Praxis class is bringing desserts. So we appreciate your time, and Dr. Coppin will take over for the rest of worship. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. I get the rest of the time. Sorry about that. (laughs) Emily said so. We are observing today All Saints Day, a long tradition in Christian history, where we remember those folks who have uh, gone to heaven Within, within the last year, from November the 1st of 2017 until today. We have lost two church members, and heaven has gained them this year. Carol George just recently went home to be with the Lord after an extended uh, illness with cardiac um, issues. But we remember Carol. Her son still lives in their apartment over here across from Southeast Christian Church, Carol was a member here for several years, um, and she was a kind and gentle, sweet lady. And then we remember Matilda Waddle. Uh, Matilda and Jean were members here two times. Uh, They came, and I met them at Walnut Street Baptist Church when they moved their letter from here to Walnut Street Baptist sometime in the 1980s. And then they came back to Middletown in 2002. Uh, Her husband, Gene, is surviving, and he is at uh, Little Sisters of the Poor over behind Audubon Hospital and doing very well and would love to see you when you're in that part of the town. Matilda was a nurse and spent her life taking care of people, but she also did beautiful uh, needlework. She was a quilter, and Christy and I bought at the auction, and she gave us a couple we have four of her miniature quilts. 
and they have beautiful little tiny embroidery and little stitches, and they're in frames, and they are art treasures for us of uh, Matilda. And I know we remember Matilda and her great big broad smile and um, miss her still. I know that there are um, folks here who have lost loved ones in this year, and I'm going to ask you if you would, if there's someone in your life that you want us to remember and thank God for today, uh, who you've lost in the last year, I want you to stand and remain standing for this prayer. So would you stand at this time? And as I look around the room, I know there's parents and a sister and grandparents, and um, we remember all of these folks, our friends. And as difficult as it is to be away from them now, but to think of them as in heaven cheering us on and encouraging us is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Pray with me. Loving Father, you've given us so many wonderful gifts, but perhaps the best are the people that you send into our lives. Some of them are parents or grandparents that have loved us every single day of our lives. Others are friends who came in and who stood beside us during difficult days or taught us or mentored us. Some of them are children and grandchildren that we loved since the day they were born. And so, Father, our hearts are full of gratitude today for the gift of these dear loved ones. My prayer is that as the years continue, that the wonderful memories that we shared with them will grow richer and deeper and more permanent. That any days of pain and sorrow will diminish into the background. And the closer we get to heaven, the more we anticipate that great reunion when we see you, O oh Lord, face to face. And then we see our loved ones. For many of them, we prayed for healing. And healing came through a new body. Thank you, O oh God, for the promise of a future. The promise of a new body. And a place where tears pain and sorrow are all gone until we join them O oh Lord until we also are remembered make our lives purposeful give us meaning help us to be people who leave the world behind better than we found it we thank you for these dear, dear loved ones. And all God's people say, Amen. you may be seated. Good morning. This is a reading from Psalm 119. <clears throat> Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with his, their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. And all God's people say, Amen. Probably every one of us have had someone 
who especially influenced us in our Christian life and modeled the Christian walk for us. We give thanks to God for those people in our lives and for those saints, and we honor them by living for God and reaching out to others. Our offertory hymn this morning is For All the Saints. Would you join me in standing? our deacons to now come to receive this morning's offering. We think of the saints as those who are in heaven, who have gone on ahead and who are already singing praises to the Lord. But there's also some folks among us who live lives that are worth copying, and I don't want to embarrass uh, Jim Grease too much, a little bit's okay. <laughs> And coming out of his Catholic background, uh, don't call him a saint in that way. <laughs> but through Jim's work and model that he set, others have now picked up his leadership. And because of Jim's um, model and others' work, another $1,000 for a way forward, equaling $98,000. Let's remember that half of that is scrap metal that, came, that did not go into a landfill and pollute the earth, and the other half is from living saints who have given generously to support um, this debt retirement. Who has our prayer today? Oh, right here. All right. He's quiet. Deacon Kevin Smith comes to ask God's blessing on this offering. All right. Pray with me, please. Help us to be generous givers, dear Lord, both our money and our lives, that we might make a difference in this town and community. Bless the gift and the giver, Lord, for we know all good things come from you. I pray these things through your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave all that he was, that we might know life in all its fullness. Amen. Amen.
morning. It's certainly good to see everyone again this morning. Um, and as as I always point out, you know, it's a privilege and honor to be able to come before you and um, and, and join with the, everyone here in prayer this morning. And in terms of our, our church family, um, we've had some folks in the hospital this past week, um, some who are, are, are no longer in the hospital, um, So, but, but would I'm sure covet our prayers for continued recovery, um, R.L. Abel and, and Mike May. Um, and then um, we've learned this morning Juanita Kincaid is still in the hospital, so I'm, I'm sure she would covet our continued prayers as well. Okay, so she might be moving to rehab next week if things go according to plan. So thank you for that update as well. Um, but I'm sure in a room this size, there are many people here too who would say, you know, please remember me as there are things on my heart and, and concerns that I have as well. So just by a show of hands, who would say, please pray for me? All right. Will you all join me in prayer this morning? Lord, as we come to you this morning, we are reminded that you are the beginning and ending of all things. And we're reminded in your word that you do promise to wipe every tear from our eyes. And you promise that death and mourning will be no more. And we are reminded that you are a God who comes and makes your home among us. And you abide with us as our God. So this morning we ask that you hear us as we pray together for those in our church family who have been in the hospital and are, and are continuing to recover. We just pray for healing, for strength daily. And we pray for those who, have, who are ill and, and in the hospital or, or even who are ill and just cannot be with us this day. We pray for healing. We pray for continued strength. We pray for comfort and for strength for those family members as well. And this morning we lift up to you those who are shut in, who just cannot physically be present with us. We pray that they sense your presence with them. And we pray that you use us to remind them that they are a part of this church family and that they are loved and that they are not forgotten. And this morning we lift up to you those unspoken concerns in our lives. You already know what we need before we even ask. And we just pray that you remind us of your presence in our lives on a daily basis. And this morning we can't help but pray for those in our communities, both near and far from us, who are grieving, who have lost loved ones due to acts of violence, who are who find themselves traumatized by the things that they've witnessed, who find themselves wrestling with fear and uncertainty. And we pray that you remind us, that you teach us daily, not to resort to retaliation, not to resort to fear, but that you remind us that your way is a way of love. Help us to love those who are hurting, but also teach us to love those who commit such acts of violence. Because regardless of their actions, they are still your children. And this morning as we've gathered here and we remember those saints in our lives who have gone before us. And we, we find ourselves encouraged by the things that they have taught us. 
We pray that you teach us to be the saints that you call each of us to be. As together we pray the prayer that Jesus continues to teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. reading from Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. The beautiful words, a new heaven and a new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a, and a new earth. For the, uh, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem right, coming down from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the, from the throne saying, Look, God dwells God's dwelling place is now among the, uh, among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be, will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has, has passed away. He, was, uh, he, was, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they my children. This is the word of God. Stand in your presence to my 
I can only imagine Thank you, Travis. Magnificent. Something else happened in worship today that you may not have recognized right off the um, right off the beat is that we had Kelly doing sign language. Some of our young people have put together a drama and worship team, and today was their first step. But they have planned many things all the way till the first of the year through Christmas and I want to commend them and thank them for their willingness to step up this is their work Leslie and I met with them and I gave them a stack of these things called books <laughs> and I'm they looked at them like it was Greek or something no they didn't but um, I appreciate them stepping up and uh, giving leadership and for Travis as one of our younger adults to give a wonderful testimony I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31. There's Bibles in front of you, or I'm assuming if you're looking at your phone, you're reading your Bible. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33. Jeremiah had a vision of a future... For God would finish the covenant that he made with Abraham. And this is the covenant. Jeremiah 31, verse 
verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Did that sound familiar to what Don was reading? No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord because they will all know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The word of the Lord. The dream of Jeremiah was the dream of Abraham that they would know God and be known by God. I grew up with a King James Bible. Raise your hand if you grew up reading a King James Bible. That's most of us in here. And as a Christian teenager reading the King James Bible, when we got to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Adam knew Eve. Well, more modern translations are a little more um, realistic about what that meant. But as teenagers... We would say to each other in youth group, oh, do you know her? Oh, you know her? How do you mean you know her? That word know is throughout the Bible, not exactly in that sense of the word. You need to read a more modern translation to get the true sense of that word. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that wonderful love chapter, Paul says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. I hope you're picking up that I have a theme going today. And if you're going to take a nap, let me give you the, the summary to the message. Heaven is to know God and to be known by God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, Paul says, And I pray that you may know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 8, 3, Whoever loves God is known by God. So it's more than just cognitive awareness or an acquaintance with or even an understanding of to know God and to be known by God is transformative to us. It changes us. Marvelous verse out of the book of Job. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Job was not talking about knowing up here that his Redeemer was alive. He knew it here. This intimacy with God, to know God and be known by God, is communion, unity, oneness with God. Don read one of my favorite passages of Scripture, that 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. John, writing in that book, is talking about heaven. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And the sea of separation that was around the throne is completely gone. And the new Jerusalem, the holy city, came down from God, prepared as a bride. And what Don read, the dwelling place, is now, the dwelling place of God is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. And then John goes on to give us this beautiful picture of heaven as built on a foundation of precious stones. Diamonds and emeralds and rubies are so common that they are the, the building blocks. And the walls are so high and thick and wide that no evil could penetrate it. And every gate is made of a single pearl. But the gate never closes because there's nothing to be afraid of. And there's no sun or moon because 
The Lord himself is the only light. And the only building in the whole place is a giant temple. And from the temple flows the river of life. And as we sang in southwest Missouri on the day I was baptized at the for, um, the uh, um, fork of the Palm de Terre River, shall we gather at the river that flows from the throne of God. But the best part of all of that is not the beautiful picture. By the way, the streets of heaven are paved with green and gold. There's no orange or blue or red to be found. <laughs> Just wanted you to know that, Steve. Uh, Notre Dame was not what I had in mind. <laughs> but the best part of all of this is that heaven is intimacy with God. God is there. And that's really all we need to know. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, that marvelous love chapter, he says uh, the word no in three times in three tenses. For those of you who like the, uh, uh, the Greek, now I know in present tense, then I shall know in future tense as I am fully known in a passive voice by someone else. Heaven this intimacy with God is God's action toward us. So Paul's vision of Christ's return and of our entrance into heaven is simply this. We will know and be known. The truth is we don't yet fully know. Paul says that. We don't live right now. There is a separation between earth and heaven. We live with feet in two different worlds. We draw close to God, and yet we still have to deal with the problems of life. We live with the not yet, but we also live with what will be. We receive strength and joy from knowing what's coming. It's a miracle of God's grace that he loves us already with our smells and our habits and our selfishness and our thoughts and our stupid mistakes and our intentional mistakes. He loves us now. It's the work of Jesus to bring to us God's grace, which allows us to know him. Now, I want you to think about it for a minute. If heaven is knowing God, then hell must be not knowing God. Worse than a fiery place with a really bad coffee and a devil with horns, whatever you think hell is, worse than that is to be cut off from God unrecognized and unseen. It's a place of devastation. It's a place of an anonymity. No one knows you. And you don't know God. So if we think about the, the being disconnected from God as a sense of hell, we also then understand how desperately lonely it is and dangerous it is to be separated from each other now. I did a little research. April the 19th of 1995, Timothy McVeigh drove a, a rented truck loaded with 5,000 pounds of explosives into the Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City and killed 168 people including 19 children in a daycare and another 684 more were injured. To my knowledge, all of them 
total strangers to him. He could kill them because he did not know them. On October the 1st, 2017, a year ago, Stephen Paddock fired 1,100 rounds of ammunition from the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas, killing 58 and wounding 851, all strangers to him. On October the 24th, just two weeks ago, Gregory Bush killed two black people, a man and a woman, on the parking lot of the Stony Brook Kroger. Both of them total strangers to him. They were the wrong color at the wrong place at the wrong time, even though his ex-wife is an African-American and his son is biracial. But he could kill a total stranger. Last week on October the 28th, Robert Bowers shot and killed 11 worshipers of the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, opening fire and shooting indiscriminately. All of them were total strangers to him. Now, there's, I'm certainly not smart or wise enough to figure out why people do such hideous things, except I want to say this. One of the threads is that the people that they killed were total strangers to them. They did not know them, nor were they known by them. If hatred is the opposite of love, it is alienation and aloneness. And so loving someone means knowing someone. I want to give you just a quick sociology moment. Sociology class, we, and I teach the intro stuff. We always talk about a German scholar named Ferdinand Tunney's, 1880s to 1920s, who in talking about different kinds of communities talks about Gemeinschaft community. Gemeinschaft community is, a, is primary one-on-one -on -one relationships. You know my name, I know your name. It is personal and it's often translated in English Gemeinschaft as community and then he compares that to Gesellschaft which is translated society it's secondary relationships distant impersonal some of you are from small towns and I when I tell my students I said if you're from a small town who do you call to fix your plumbing oh we call Fred who do you call to fix your car? Oh, we call Jerry. Those of you who are from Louisville, who do you call to fix your plumbing? Um, I Google plumbing and the first one that comes up. And who do you call to fix your car? I have a guy. What's that? Keith. Say, you cheat. You cheat. But my students don't know Keith. But who do you call to fix your car? Well, I go, I drive into the dealership and some guy, I don't know his name, takes my car and some guy takes it and works on it. Gemeinschaft is that one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship. Gazelleshaft is that impersonal secondary. One is gratifying and life nourishing and the other is isolating and painful and dehumanizing. It happens to us in day-to-day -day life. We talk about those people rather than, oh, oh, that's Fred and Ethel, or Ali and Zara, or Manuel and Rosa. But it's those people. Or the gallbladder in room two is ready for you, doctor, rather than Mrs. Smith is waiting in room two. It's my headache in the second period class rather than Jimmy, who is talking to his neighbors but is really struggling to understand math and using the distraction as a way to get away with it. We turn people into things and we lose knowledge of who they are. I want to show you a picture that came around Facebook this week. Uh, a woman sitting in a doctor's office wa in a waiting room watched a transaction going on the other side of the room. 
a young mother came in with a new baby and was handed a bunch of papers. You know how they do that, right? The baby's asleep. She can't fill out these papers, and this is what happened. A man on the other side of the room, that red mark is somebody obscuring her identity. A man on the other side of the room approached her and said, could I hold your baby while you fill out your papers? That's what I'm talking about. To cross the barriers of those people to being one-on-one. -on -one to helping someone. I have permission of Gary Millsap to say his name so I don't owe him a dollar. Um, but if Gary ever invites you to go to lunch, go. Always go. Because when he gets into lunch, Gary knows all the servers and they know him. Now they know him because he is an outstanding tipper. But I'm telling you, when you eat with Gary, your uh, iced tea glass never gets less than half full it's amazing he gets amazing service but Gary who is a very quiet person most of the time makes a point to know who's waiting on him so if heaven is to know and to be known then heaven on earth is to know each other and to be known by each other Every time we know someone and are known, we are tasting just a little taste of what heaven will be. Because it's harder to hate somebody when we already know their story. It's easier to love someone when we get to know them and we let them get to know us. It is dangerous to live in a anonymous world the gospel of Jesus is an invitation to us to know God and to be known by God and at the end of the service when we invite you uh, when I be, invite you on behalf of the church to know God that is a marvelous invitation to know and to be known and then there's an invitation to come into the church family. One of the things that happens in a church this size is we know each other. And we are known by each other. We live in a community of believers to drop the walls and to know and be known. In the next chapter of Revelation, the very last chapter in the Bible, in the third verse, John writes, The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Richard Baxter, a Christian man in the 1600s, wrote these words. My knowledge of that life is dim, is small. The eye of faith, it's dim. But it's enough that Christ knows all, and I shall be with him. Pray with me. Loving Father, you know us and you love us still. And you have made a way for us to know you. And because of that, we already know what heaven is going to be like. Whether there's jewels and pearls and gold, whatever that is like pales in comparison 
to the joy we will have in knowing you and being known by you. We offer ourselves to you, Lord, and ask you to help us to get to know you even better. Help us to get to know each other better. Help us to pattern after you that as we know you, we love as you love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing that wonderful old gospel.